Welcome to Community Chat. As you know, this is a program that we have various guests on to better inform you, the resident, the viewer. We are joined for this segment by State Senator John Keenan. As uh, we try to have a regular conversation uh, with the State Senator. Senator, how are you? How are you doing? We're in May. I can't believe we're already in May. I can't believe we're in May either. It time has gone by so quickly, but it, it's great to see you. And it's, um, and thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. A absolutely. So while we have a chance uh, to to sit here and chat, probably one of the first things I would ask you is, um, how have things gone as to any bills or amendments that you've been able to file for this new legislative session? Well, uh, we've we filed a lot of bills, and the bill filing deadline was extended this year, so they have just been assigned to committee, and we will now start the process of each one of the bills having a hearing. In terms of legislation that we've taken up, just just uh, yesterday we took up a bill in the Senate following what the House had done relative to the construction of a new Holyoke Soldiers Home. And it will be a, a $400 million project with about 65% of the funding for that reimbursed by the federal government. And then in the Senate, we added about $200 million more to look at veteran services throughout the Commonwealth and to target uh, areas, make sure that they're equitably distributed for additional veteran services, uh, facilities, programs, and as I say, services. So in, in that bill, I filed uh, three amendments. All of them were adopted by my colleagues. And the purpose of those amendments was just to make sure that every veteran in every area of the Commonwealth has access to equal care, equal services, and equal programming. And so, so that will be done uh, by way of having a hearing in six different regions across the Commonwealth by making sure that as they look at where these programs, facilities, and services are offered, that there's an eye towards whether they are accessible by public transportation. Because one of the things that I see and hear is that veterans who go to Brockton or, or to West Roxbury VA, sometimes they have difficulty getting there. And thankfully, there are so many volunteers, but it is difficult for families as well. And so those are the types of things that we focused on in that bill, uh, in addition to making sure that there's uh, services provided, we want to make sure that they're equitably provided, uh, not only by neighborhood, but by region. And, and also, we want to make sure that the project is a project that will be built in, in the right way. So there's a lot of work done on it, and I'm thrilled it passed, and uh, my, my colleagues really worked hard on it. So it's a, it's a good bill. How important is it that we make sure that we're taking care of the, the men and the women who has served our country, not only in times of peace, but in times of war, and that they get the necessary care and programs that are due to them. It, it's so important. When you, when you think of somebody who raises their hand, basically, and says, I'll step forward, and then commits generally four years of their life to, to the, the United States military, and whether that's overseas duty or duty here in the United States is still four years of sacrifice. And we have an obligation to make sure that that sacrifice is matched uh, with proper medical care, with educational opportunities. And when they're in most in need, whether because of medical issues or lack of housing, that we provide all of, all of those things for them. Uh, it's, it's part of a fair deal. And we have to make sure that we hold up our end of it. If you're just tuning in, uh, we are joined by State Senator John Keenan. He is uh, my guest for this particular segment. Um, Senator, I've long known you as a champion, you know, prior to the pandemic of, fo of, of folks who are battling addiction and the issues that we have had with it. And you have been instrumental in a lot of, of um, bills that have been become law and a lot of measures that have become standard now. And I think you've continued that trend with some of the bills and amendments that you have filed this session. Uh, are there any uh, that, that come to mind that you'd want to share with the audience? I'm uh, sure um, there's, there's a few. One of the things that we were successful in passing, I want to say about six years ago now, and it, it arose as a result of going to the morgue in Boston, the, um, the Commonwealth's uh, medical examiner's office, was we introduced legislation very quickly that was adopted that allows 
the Commonwealth to use all of its different data sets to inform us on trends within the substance use area so that we know how people got to the point of using substances to the point of addiction. Uh, we know what type of treatment they may have received and we can model programs around that. And one of the things that we use that for was uh, to determine whether medication assisted treatment was appropriate within correctional facilities. And we found out that people who were coming out of correctional facilities were six times more likely to die of a drug overdose. And so there was a, an obvious need that hadn't been seen before for uh, medication assisted treatment within correctional facilities. So we introduced that and got that passed as a result of what we call the chapter 55 data collection efforts. So one of the bills that we filed this session is to add an additional data set to that uh, data collection program. This would be information from the Department of Revenue and it would really help us get a better picture of what's going on. All the information is what they call de-identified. So it's not an individual basis. It's data in the aggregate that gives us a sense of trends. Um, and the program that we developed is, is really a national model. And the folks who crunch all the numbers and do all the analysis will tell you that pretty much every week they get a call from somebody else in the country, somewhere else in the country, asking what it was uh, Massachusetts did, how they're doing it, and how helpful it's been. So we have uh, filed that. We've also uh, filed again our, our bill to try to get uh, insurance coverage for those who are seeking treatment for addiction, uh, coverage for up to 30 days. We were successful in the past in getting it for 15 days. This bill would extend it for 30 days. Incredibly, although it's fewer, but incredibly still, uh, insurers are denying coverage for substance use addiction treatment, and we've got to address that. We also, on the prevention side, we know that uh, some people, many people, uh, go down the path to its dependency and addiction as a result of being prescribed opioids. Our prescribing numbers, as a result of work that we did on our prescription monitoring program and uh, physician monitoring, um, those numbers are way down, but some people still progress through dependency to addiction as a result of prescribed medications. And so we wanna make sure that there's insurance coverage for alternatives to opioids. Incredibly, I could hurt my shoulder and a doctor without any sort of pre-approval from an insurance company could just write me a, a medication to address my pain, uh, write me a prescription rather for medication. But if that doctor thinks that uh, physical therapy or chiropractic care or acupuncture is better suited for me, that physician has to go through all kinds of hoops in order to get approval from the insurance company for that. So we're trying to eliminate those barriers to non-opioid pain treatment. We're also there's an interconnection between mental health and substance use. And we wanna make sure that if somebody is in a mental health facility that's equipped to treat their addiction issues as well, or if they're in an addiction treatment program that's equipped to address their mental health issues, that they don't have to go from one facility to another, that they can get the care in the place where they are and that that will be covered by insurance. Right now, in many instances, uh, addiction treatment programs are only providing coverage by insurance companies for addiction even though mental health is such a big part of that. So those are some of the bills that we, we filed. And, and just a, uh, another one that I'll touch on very quickly is while we have focused on opioid addiction for many years, while the rest of the country has had to deal with a methamphetamine issue, that's coming our way. And so I filed a bill and I'm hoping to fast track it to put a group to pe of people together to study the issue, to report out in September, and to start putting programming and services in place so that we're not overwhelmed with a methamphetamine crisis like they have in other parts, like they have been in other parts of the country. It's coming. The, uh, just about two weeks ago, the DEA issued a warning in Massachusetts that pills that look like ADD medication uh, that are out on the, on the streets, Adderall, are actually counterfeit. They're not Adderall. They are pressed methamphetamine, 100% pure. And the DEA has advised Massachusetts and New England that the drug cartels have made a conscious decision to put these drugs into our communities with the idea of targeting a younger population. So we have to be ready. It's an entirely different response than what we have in place for opioids. Senator, do you kind of feel that the general public has kind of because of the pandemic forgotten that we we still had that underlying issue that something that didn't go away and if anything 
it might have been exacerbated a bit because of the pandemic. It was uh, across Massachusetts, across the country, opioid overdose deaths were up during the pandemic. And we have become, unfortunately, just so used to seeing high daily death numbers. And here in Massachusetts, as, as we speak, we are still losing uh, over about a dozen people a day and uh, you know, 12, 15, 18, 10 people a day to COVID. And we are still alarmed by that. And we are losing that many people to opioid overdose deaths um, as well. You know, pre-pandemic, we were up to over you know, 2,000 deaths per year that was trending down, but now it's increased. So we were used to uh, seven or eight overdose deaths a day. And to us, that was alarming. And now compared to COVID, it doesn't seem to be as alarming. But as those COVID numbers come down as they are, we'll will it'll become apparent to us again that we still have an opioid epidemic issue and that people are dying unnecessarily and that we have an obligation to do the best that we can to address that uh, epidemic whether it's a pandemic with covid or an epidemic with opioids and hopefully uh, nothing similar with methamphetamine we have an obligation to, to get out in front of these things and to provide care and treatment for people it's such a scary prospect, knowing that we were dealing with opioids, and then you're talking about fentanyl. This is fentanyl is very deadly, and it's got different forms. And then the methamphetamine that you're you're talking about—that's the next thing on the doorstep. I mean, I ask this as a rhetorical question. There's real no, there's real no, no real answer. But when does it end? You know, I I don't know. Uh, I did a lot of reading when I, w I was a kid and I, I read some novels and there was one novel that stuck out to me, a book. It wasn't a novel. It was an autobiography called Foul. It was the story of Connie Hopkins, who was a basketball player who, uh, because of a gambling scandal, never quite made it in the NBA. Uh, he was, he was you know, basically kept out of the league for many years. But I remember reading that book and it was about him growing up in New York City and the prevalence of heroin in the community, he grew up in bedford Stuy in New York City, and the prevalence of heroin in that community. But that's where it used to be. Um, unfortunately, it was confined, and so it didn't uh, get the attention that it needed. Only when it spread beyond that did it start to get the attention. So there has been a his an historical level of substance use and death related to substance use. And for so long now, we have just been so far above that historical level. And we have to get down to that level and then below. But we have to recognize that it is something that we are going to have to deal with always, as long as we have a mental health issues, as long as we have access to uh, drugs, as long as there are people willing to come up with the next new addictive drug, a dangerous drug, uh, we're going to have to deal with it. Changing topics from, uh, from bills and, and drug addiction to mm -hmm. Uh, finances, state finances. We know that last week the House of Reps uh, they did their budget. Uh, well, guess what? State Senate's up next. I'm looking forward to the conversation. And have you been con have you had conversations with your communities in regards to local aid? I have had conversations with uh, communities relative to local aid. That's always the biggest issue. And uh, based on some preliminary numbers and a preliminary agreement that was reached between the Senate and the House of Representatives, um, it looks like, for instance, a community like Abington will get about $800,000 more in, in local aid than last year. But just right next door, Rockland won't get um, really much of an increase at all because of uh, the way that the local aid formula, particularly Chapter 70, which is school funding, how that aid is determined. So we're looking to make sure that the aid is distributed equitably. Uh, Abington is in a relatively good position in terms of what it will get in local aid. There has been federal money uh, for Abington through uh, the CARES Act, which has been uh, handled well. The money has been handled very well by Plymouth County commissioners and the Plymouth County treasurer that have really done a good job of getting that out to the communities. There'll be more federal money coming, but we wanna make sure that that recurring funding for Chapter 70 in particular, which is school aid, is in place. We passed the Student Opportunity Act in Massachusetts, which sets us on a path towards equalizing funding for uh, educational opportunity across the Commonwealth. 
And this is the first year that we're really uh, putting ourselves on a track to, to reach that goal. And Local Aid Chapter 70 is, is such an important part of that. So that's going to be one of the main focuses going through the budget process to, is to make sure that our communities get the resources they need to educate their students, to make sure that police and fire are funded, to make sure that libraries and all those critical services have the resources they need uh, to really enhance uh, the community. I know one of the things that, that have been touted is that you know, communities are getting, and I think that the state is getting a big chunk of from the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, does the Senate, the, does the legislature have any say in the potential four or $5 billion that we're going to get from the federal government? No, no say directly. Where the Senate has been successful is in making, in, is advocating. Um, you know, the, the money comes in and it will either come through the state government or the uh, county governments. And in the past, it, it, with the last round that we got from the federal government, Plymouth County was the only county that took on that responsibility. Other counties are now contemplating doing that and in the process keeping administrative costs quite low. So it really will be determined by the governor and the county government, and then the funding will go to the local level to be spent um, as they see consistent with the guidelines put out by the federal government. And that's the key. It's going to be a, a bit of a process to make sure that municipalities are able to match spending with the requirements. Because if they don't, they, there's, there's going to be issues. But uh, we're confident that the communities in my district anyway, they were all, <clears throat> excuse me, professionally well managed. And so they will make very good use of that funding. Is it safe to say that the, the distribution of CARES Act funds by the Plymouth County government or the, whether it's the commissioners or the, the treasurer's office has been a resounding success? I, I think it has. In talking to the town managers and the town administrators, they have been very pleased with the work that's been done by Plymouth County. And there, were, there was some hesitation because it was a lot of money. And I can't remember the exact dollar figure, but there was a lot of money. And there was a question of whether the county had the infrastructure and the administrative processes in place to handle it. And they worked very quickly to make sure that everything was put in place quickly. And I, I've had conversations with the commissioners and with uh, Treasurer O'Brien, and they've really done a good job. They, uh, the towns have found them to be very responsive. And there's still other rounds of funding to come from that money for the, for the local towns. So uh, I congratulate them on the work that they've done. It seems to be working well, and they've done it by keeping administrative costs, while keeping administrative costs very low. <clears throat> so as we wrap this up, anything you'd like to say in closing uh, during this particular segment? And again, I thank you for your time. No, thank you, Kevin. It's, it's been great to, to be here, and um, it's great to, to try to get out in front of the, the residents of, of Abington, however that may be, by radio or by cable. So I really appreciate it. And just to let you know that we continue, have continued and will continue to work on your behalf. There's a lot of challenges still out there, but there's also really good news on the horizon. Uh, the number of people getting vaccinated in Massachusetts is, is really high. And we're starting to see that in lower COVID cases. And we're seeing our economy rebound. Uh, our, the latest reports are that our economy is rebounding at a significantly higher rate than what the country is as a whole. So those are all good things. And if I just want to encourage people, if you've got your first shot and there's a hesitancy about your second shot, please don't be hesitant. Get that second shot. Give yourself and your family the protection that you need. And, and the, the world will open up uh, this summer when people do that. Um, don't worry about side effects. I had the second shot. I think I was fairly typical. I had a sore arm. And 24 hours later, I, I was a little tired. Some people don't have any side effects. Many of my relatives have had no side effects. Others have something that, you know, they explain it as like a sore throat. But it's nothing compared to the risk of the COVID virus. If we're going to get this under control, please get your first. And if you had your first, get your second shot and continue to do all the things that we need to do so that this summer can be a great summer for everybody. I'm really looking forward to it. There he is. State Senator John Keenan has been our guest for the seg segment. Thank you so much, Senator. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Be well. And we thank you for tuning in and watching this program, Community Chat. Until next time, please have a great day.